Chuck? Vincent, we've been over this. You call me Dr. Bregman, except at the annual Christmas party when you're allowed to call me by my first name, Charles. You got something, Manny? I don't know, Cobb. Probably nothing. Never mind. You really shouldn't encourage him. If corporate finds out, they'll see this as a breakdown of protocol, and it'll be reflected in our annual efficiency review, and I- Look, man, who's gonna tell him? You? We can't afford any more cuts, that's all I'm saying. We can barely keep the lights on now. Shit. You want a soda or something? Hey, buddy, we're stepping out for a minute. Hold down the fort, huh? Sure, Cobb. Sure. What the- No, 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 no! Don't you fucking- Well, hello. Cobb? Cobb, you guys hearing this? Chuck? Damn it, where are you? Okay, wait. There's this old saying that there are only two stories in the world. Either a hero goes on a journey, or a stranger comes to town. This is obviously untrue, cinema is rife with counterexamples, but these plots are everywhere. And in horror, they run the gamut from invaders from space, to our parents got divorced, and now we live in the murder capital of the world. But step back, and you might notice something. These actually aren't two stories. They're two sides of the same coin. A character arrives somewhere pursuing a goal. Searching for answers, or seeking revenge, reliving old memories, or trying to make new ones. Maybe just hungry. The locals are standoffish, even hostile. Their customs are quaint, strange, and terrible. Oh my god! But now turn it around. A stranger comes to town. He's boorish, he's impatient. Intentionally or not, he tramples all over local custom. He expects everyone to accommodate his way of life and reshape themselves in his image. If they're lucky, he'll go away. Some of them might even survive. It's really a question of perspective. Whose side are we on? The policeman investigating a disappearance, or Maine's version of Mayberry? The young couple just arrived in Haiti, or the isolated villagers excited for the diversion of a traveling circus? What all these stories have in common is a sense of otherness. The local and the visitor are separated by more than just geography. Their relationship is binary, with each camp pitched on opposite sides of an unbridgeable chasm. Black white, urban, rural, Christian, pagan, human, inhuman. The other may look like us, may sound like us, but like Edward Hyde, they must be deformed somewhere, even if we really can name nothing out of the way. That isn't Uncle Ira. So the other repels us, but it simultaneously pulls us closer. I think he's fascinating. Promising exciting worlds we've hardly dared dream of. He's been everywhere, seen so much, not like the boys here. I mean, it's sexy, it's exotic. He's 
but also dangerous. Untrustworthy. After all, I mean, it's still not normal. Which brings up another point. In order to posit an other, we have to strictly define the not other. The normal. Us. Throughout horror history, that definition has been mostly consistent. The in-group is white, Christian, middle class, usually American. And the other is, well, everyone else. I recognize the irony of someone like me getting on a high horse about this. I really do. And I want to be clear, I'm not saying these are bad movies or calling you racist for enjoying them. I mean, I love Gremlins. But its portrayal of Asian characters and its running commentary about foreigners is problematic at the very least. And you see this throughout the genre. Normal is the little white girl trying to get ahead at work. The other is that gross old Romany woman who's going to steal your candy the minute your back is turned. I think that, as horror fans, we have a responsibility to look critically at the unpleasant subtexts that often run through the genre. It may mean the destruction of the white race. And I think it's important that we examine those films that push back against the othering of people who aren't, well, me. To that end, let's look at two horror films that grapple directly with the question of racial othering. Joe Cornish's Attack the Block and Jordan Peele's Get Out. <laughs> Also, real quick, both Attack the Block and Get Out follow the basic plot that I outlined before. An outsider arrives in a strange place and is met with hostility from the locals. The differences between both groups are laid bare, violence erupts, the usual song and dance. At the same time, though, both movies subvert horror's traditional definition of the other. I told you so. Get Out inverts the racial coding which has unfortunately persisted throughout much of horror's history. If there's too many white people, I get nervous, you know. Older films might present the black man as exotic, inscrutable, simmering with barely contained violence. She's alive in the hands of natives. Oh no, better dead than that. But Jordan Peele flips the script, making the unknowable, dangerous others the white people. Protagonist Chris is an artist who eschews violence until he's pushed to the brink. Up to that point, though, he's just trying to get through this increasingly uncomfortable weekend. Is it better? Wow, wow. And who can't relate to the anxiety of meeting a partner's family for the first time? Attack the Block, meanwhile, starts us off with false binaries. We meet Sam, a young nurse heading home after a long shift. She's even on the phone with her mom. I mean, everything points toward her as the film's protagonist. So when a gang of hoodie-wearing young men surrounds her, we worry. We can't see their faces. One of them has a knife. Will they stop at mugging her? Once the real outsider enters the picture, though, our perspective shifts, realigning us with the kids. Because once the bandanas come down, we realize that's literally what they are. A group of children, trapped in a system that only knows how to ignore them, or lock them up. They might mug the odd pedestrian, or deal a little weed, they try to act tough, but underneath, they're basically good kids who just want to go home and play some FIFA. Sorry I messed up your couch. That doesn't excuse their behavior, as Sam points out several times, but it places them in a wider context that makes it easier to understand them. The boys also turn out to have more in common with Sam than we first realize. It turns out they live in the same public housing development, in the same building even. This matters because they turn out to be fierce defenders of their home and their neighbors. Later on in the film, Moses, the leader of the gang, explains that if they had known Sam lived in the block, they wouldn't have mugged her in the first place. The dividing lines just keep getting redrawn. Ultimately, what separates these insiders from the outsiders, the human outsiders anyway, 
is their ability to grasp the situation. Hey, this ain't got nothing to do with gangs. Or drugs, or rap music, or violence in video games. Sam and the kids are the in-group. Also, there's this stoner rich kid named Brewis. I'm too high for this shit. And Nick Frost fits in there somewhere, I guess. But Hi-Hats denies, then minimizes the extraterrestrial threat. Easy kill. He's out, in more ways than one. At the film's conclusion, the police arrest the remaining boys, blaming them for all the violence in South London that night. The cops look at Moses, and they reduce him to a handful of bullet points, young, poor, black, and make assumptions from there. They don't see. The white people in Get Out aren't that different. So how long has this been going on? Thing. <laughs> For them, black people are entirely reducible to their physical bodies, and black bodies are a desirable commodity. White characters speak of the advantages of black genetics, they heap praise on Barack Obama. I would have voted for Obama for a third term if I could. As one attendee of the increasingly bizarre party says, Black is in fashion. To these people, being black is performative, it's fashionable. Something to acquire for a time and then discard when it becomes passé. It has nothing to do with the inner experiences of personhood. No, 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 no. This becomes ironically apparent through the character of Jim Hudson, a blind art dealer who admires Chris's photography based on descriptions he's heard. You have a great eye. Now, when we talk about a photographer's eye, we mean their way of seeing in an artistic sense, an amalgamation of talent and training and life experiences combined with their sense of what's important, of what deserves to be seen. These are all attributes of the psyche, you know, the parts of the mind that form the individual personality. So later, when Hudson reveals that he's the one who purchased Chris's body, and he says, I want your eye, man. He's not just saying he wants to see again. He wants Chris's artistic sensibilities for himself. Those aspects of Chris are precisely the parts that the coagula procedure is designed to lock away in the sunken place. But in Hudson's mind, they won't be, because to him, Chris's eye is analogous to his eyes. To these outsiders, everything that makes Chris himself can be collapsed into a single point, the tangible reality of his black body. I've been wondering if the total darkness of the sunken place is supposed to symbolize this same idea. Hypnotized, Chris falls through unending night, unable to move or speak, and too far away to have any agency. He's swallowed up by the abstract blackness he's been thrust into. In the same way, maybe the intensely black fur of the aliens in Attack the Block represents the all-consuming attribute imposed on Moses from the outside. If he doesn't find a way to break free of the box he's been forced into, and to assert himself as a whole, complex person with multiple identities, it'll tear him to pieces. Our survival depends on the mind's ability to split reality into categories. That's a rock, that's a banana, that's a newborn xenomorph trying to latch onto my face and impregnate me. <laughs> Society also functions by imposing classification schemes on the world. That's legal, that's illegal, she's in the tribe, he's outside of it. But at a certain point, we kind of have to recognize that these artificial systems are just that. Artificial. Oversimplified. Past a certain point, they do more harm than good. Films like Get Out or Attack the Block ask us to reconsider how the grid gets drawn. Who's inside the line? Who's outside the line? And why? As the horror genre and cinema in general becomes more inclusive, I hope we can keep asking these questions, adding new perspectives, blurring the lines, and gaining a greater understanding of the human species as a whole 
and in each of its parts. I mean, we'd better get on that pretty soon, because there's no way to know when we're going to need to band together to fight off these sons of bitches. Hey, film dorks, what's going on? I hope you enjoyed my look at the films that fall into the category that I think of as kind of visitor from another place horror, and specifically my analysis of Attack the Block and Get Out. Get Out is obviously a very well-made movie, I give mad props to Jordan Peele for all of his hard work there, and I had an absolute blast with Attack the Block. What's your take on these two movies? What's your favorite visitor from another place horror movie? Let me know down there. If you liked this video, I hope you'll come back again. I upload two videos a month, one on the 15th, one on the last day of the month. Next video lands in approximately T-15 days. So until then, stay safe, happy, and well, and I'll see you on the flip side.